It's really difficult to completely understand the enormous impact of printing on Western history. When most of us say the printing press, we mean a whole cluster of different innovations. We don't just mean the press. A single day's issue of the New York Times contains more information than a person in the 1400s learned in a lifetime. From the time of the ancient Greeks, scribes meticulously preserved legacies of knowledge and lore of the ruling classes, for only they could afford the scribes and their tools. Through their painstaking artistry, knowledge flowed slowly and sometimes sparingly from the political and religious elite to the masses. When Johann Gutenberg pressed his first pages, little did he realize that he had set in motion a wave of changes he could neither predict nor imagine. A handmade, handwritten commercial book business had grown up in the Middle Ages. Monks copied religious texts in monasteries for the glory of God. Scribes were paid handsomely to copy books for the intellectual elite. They gathered in places called scriptoria to craft these works by hand. Scriptoria were, just as you might think, groups of scribes sitting, taking dictation from somebody who sat in a chair rather like this one and read from a text. And it was a way of duplicating a text very rapidly. But as you know, if you've ever tried to take dictation, uh, and you have, let's say, 10 students in a room, no two copies are going to be quite the same. And you're taking it in by ear, so you're going to mistranscribe a good deal. And it isn't a very good way of standardizing texts, but it is a rapid way of making copies. Hand copying of texts was slow and labor intensive. One method of mechanical printing had been invented in the Orient centuries before, but a writing system which utilized thousands of characters made the technology impractical. In the West, however, the phonetic alphabet simplified reading, writing, and eventually the duplication of texts by mechanical means. Well, the printing press came into Europe in the mid-15th century the important uh, aspect of the invention is not so much the press, that's part of the mix, but the key thing was the invention of movable type. And movable type meant that each letter was formed as a separate piece that could be recombined to say different things. The printing press then allowed the rapid multiplication of copies. When most of us say the printing press, we mean a whole cluster of different innovations. We don't just mean the press. The wooden hand press existed for wine, for olive oil, long before Gutenberg's day. And what he did was to adapt this to a new purpose. But there were a great many other innovations that were necessary to make printing feasible. And one had to do with the state of metallurgy and whether it was possible to pour molten metal into a mold and have it cool at a certain temperature uh, and whether it became possible to have an ink which would adhere to the metal. An oil-based ink uh, had to be developed in order to make it possible to uh, print using the ink uh, and, of course, uh, the development of paper. As people came back from the Crusades, they brought back with them the knowledge of making paper, which had come from the Orient. Paper was made up of um, basically linen fiber. Linen was uh, chewed up, basically, and mixed with water, and then spread evenly on a screen called a mold. And this layer of fiber, when it was pressed and, and all the water was removed, formed a solid uh, sheet of material called paper. So that paper 
was available before the invention of printing for movable type. Yet without paper, I think printing would not have had the impact that it did. The only other material they could have worked with was animal skin, such as vellum or parchment. And these were expensive and difficult to produce. So early printers did print on parchment and vellum, but paper was the, the proper medium. It was the ideal medium for printing. During the 1400s in Germany, Johann Gutenberg began to experiment with the idea of movable type combined with reusable letters shaped from molten metal. He was a silversmith, and actually the, the mix of materials, tin and antimony, that he uh, coupled with lead to make the first usable type uh, has survived all the way to this day. He hit on the right technology because he uh, had a strong background in that area. So the invention of the type mold was the single unique aspect of Gutenberg's invention. And of course the press made things just go out much faster. The interesting thing about that for technology is we don't know what Gutenberg used. He was extremely careful to see that nobody knew what he had been using. All images that you see of Gutenberg's press, uh, whether they're drawings or um, models, three-dimensional models, they're guesses. They're strictly hypothetical. The first presses we know about come from um, engravings and oil paintings from the very end of the 15th century. But whether Gutenberg's press was like that half a century before, um, we don't know. And the assumption is that he must have adapted whatever was the ordinary technology. The reason that he was successful was that he was a phenomenal artist. He was a member of the guild. Um, and his artistic input is phenomenally evident in his 42-line Bible, which is a tremendously beautiful work. So the reason that I think that he succeeded is he was able to couple that uh, exquisite artistic eye with a very deep understanding of the technology and metallurgy of the time. In the years that followed, printers refined Gutenberg's process, ever mindful that their readers were not the masses, but the rich. It's really difficult to completely understand the enormous impact of printing on Western history. With the introduction of printing, Suddenly you had multiple copies. The cost was reduced. They weren't cheap, but they were available. And suddenly people were looking for texts to, to publish. So fundamentally, printing brought a world of ideas to Western Europe. It, it would allow people to, to share their ideas very rapidly. At first, books that multiplied were aimed at a limited audience because people had to learn to read before they were able to use books. Markets begin to be uh, tapped by printers because printing is a capitalistic enterprise. And a printer has to pay for reams of paper in advance. And he's guessing that he's going to make money. And he has to tap fairly large markets in order to sell his wares. It was an exciting time as mass printing spread across Europe. Many books were printed in Latin, but commoners wanted to read books in their spoken language. So instead of turning out books in Latin, they experimented with turning out books that were translated into the vernacular languages, into English, Dutch, German, French, Spanish. Italian. But now the Bible is translated and printed and available in uh, virtually every German household. Uh, that was a major step forward. But I think there is that period when printing becomes extremely important, where uh, you have uh, the new power, which somebody said was the power of being able to speak to a multitude from one place without anybody ever seeing you. This is an entirely new development. Mathematicians, scientists, and scholars from every corner published their observations and theories. A new intellectual class emerged to absorb and further spread this new standardized knowledge. In the secular world, Martin Luther used the new medium not just to inform the masses, but to enlighten them. What's interesting about this is that printing from the beginning 
agitated people. I think of Luther, and I think of the peasants revolt and the Reformation, where cartoons and caricatures were used to stir up hatred against the Italian Pope, against Catholics uh, in German Protestant lands, and you have mobs <laughs> uh, moving in new directions, uh, fired up by printed materials. With the printing press, uh, Martin Luther was not a solitary preacher. He spoke to uh, thousands and millions of people throughout Europe, and his pamphlets uh, had a major, major impact on uh, religious discussions of the time. Uh, these pamphlets were bestsellers. So the introduction of printing allowed the Reformation to explode because all the ferment and ideas of the Reformation were, were printed. It was good business for printers, but it also brought the Counter-Reformation and lots of censorship, so you have to deal with that as well. We can say without exaggeration that it made the Reformation possible. Uh, this is a major, uh, the major cultural transformation of the, uh, in the area of religion, at least, of the last thousand years with tremendous political impact. I think largely, if not exclusively, attributable to the printing press. The power of the printed word influenced many people to follow other paths toward eternal salvation. Many of these persecuted followers of the Protestant Reformation sought refuge in a new land. Some 20 years after the Pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock, the first printing presses in America began to turn out basic books. At the beginning, the publishing was mostly religiously oriented, and at least in this country, in the 1700s, the first presses produced uh, religious books, Bibles, psalm books, prayer books, and that kind of thing. Then it got into children's instructional books. Some early textbooks sold millions of copies, Printing flourished in colonial America, providing jobs and a means for freely expressing ideas. The typical colonial print shop was a very, very busy place with lots of activity, lots of people coming and going. They usually had one printing press, sometimes two and very rarely three. And there would have been frames or stands that held cases of type. And all the letters were stored in these partitioned boxes, uh, printers assembled the letters, put them on the printing press, and printed as many copies as they needed, and then the letters were put away again. So it took about two men to set the type for each press, two men to operate each press, and so the average shop would have had at least four workmen or a couple of journeymen and some apprentices. American newspapers have probably had a certain sameness about them from the beginning. Uh, in the colonial period, they tended to copy some of the same stories out of newspapers uh, in England and elsewhere. Newspapers and pamphlets helped fuel political debates in early America and served as a public forum for writers, editors, anyone with access to a printing press. There were no editorials as such in the colonial newspapers in this country in the 18th century. Uh, the editors then were inclined to intermingle facts and opinion, or they used unsigned letters and essays to express opinion. In the 1790s, a few of the papers, such as the American Minerva, began to use editorial paragraphs, which they ran adjacent to the stories on which they commented. Uh, back in uh, revolutionary times, uh, newspapers were extremely biased, and um what did Jefferson say? Nowadays, nothing is to be believed that is seen in a newspaper. Truth itself is sullied by association with that soiled vehicle. Uh, and he said that because uh, there were a lot of opposition papers. The editors often in the pay of opposition parties, and that was the situation. It was really only about the turn of the century that the new ideal of more dispassionate news uh, came into vogue. <laughs> One of the amazing things about printing was that for a period of about 350 years, there was very little technical innovation. However, with the Industrial Revolution, that would all change. From the time of Gutenberg all the way up until the beginning of the 19th century, printers used the same kind of press, the same kind of type, and printed in pretty much the same way. The only variation being the designs of the shapes of the letters. In the 1800s, new technology in printing took 
the printer from essentially a medieval um, trade using a wooden press and a, a simple form of leverage based on the screw and a slow process of printing. And all the related trades slowed down to match this uh, slow printing press. Took it from that to a fast, a high-speed press. By the 1800s, printing underwent industrialization. Paper making was transformed by new machines, which turned out pulp instead of rags. And at the very same time, you have the first iron press harnessed to steam. Inventors had begun to think about how can we print faster. Well, the invention of new methods of casting iron, the invention of new methods of machining metal, allowed press builders to make cylinder presses. They came into use, uh, particularly 1814, with Koenig's uh, cylinder press used at the Times in London. They built his, his wonderful new steam press in the building of the Times, and they um, set it up overnight and, and printed overnight the first edition. And just to make sure there was no protest from the printers, they did this all in secret. Within a few years, uh, steam power was applied to these machines. And so we called it steam printing from that point on. Um, but these presses were much faster than the hand press. And once they were introduced, it was only a matter of refinement. They got to be faster and faster and faster. This revolutionizes the industry and displaces what was a handcraft, a hand-operated wooden press by iron machines powered by steam. So printing itself begins to seem more like a machine <laughs> than a handicraft or an art. The artisan becomes a factory worker, if you want. And the metaphor of divine art, which goes back to the Renaissance, begins to disappear. And the metaphor of an engine of progress takes its place. Faster mechanical presses gave the publishing industry a boost as mass production lowered costs and encouraged more of the masses to learn to read. There was a growing uh, readership, a larger readership. But there also were different classes of people with different levels of education, so you have different kinds of newspapers. Some newspapers were very literate and some newspapers were not. The cylinder presses allowed publishers to become much bigger. And so some newspapers became much, much more uh, profitable and much larger. As the cost of newspapers came down and audiences grew, new national magazines sprang up appealing to a variety of readers. Masses became united, not by geography, but by common interests and like-mindedness. By the mid-1800s, over 100 different magazines had hit the stands. Libraries and small shop booksellers across America fed a growing appetite for reading. Books, especially those with thinly veiled social criticism, grew popular in the 1800s. As books multiply, they become more and more available, and the trade of the bookseller uh, becomes more and more profitable, <laughs> and uh, you have um, an entire new cluster of talents formed around printing, book selling, publishing, and uh, merchandising books, advertising. Along with books, the demand for news and newspapers exploded with the Civil War. Shortly after the war, the newly completed Transcontinental Railroad created a national distribution system. Trains carried printed material from the large cities to hamlets in rural America and outposts in the West. The publishing industry thrived as new technology accelerated. Many inventors attempted to invent a machine for setting type. Uh, Mark Twain lost a fortune 
on the page typesetting machine. Ironically, it was a German machinist clockmaker named Mergenthaler, Ottmar Mergenthaler. He was working for his uncle. When inventors came to their shop asking them to please fix the machine they were working on, that machine was ultimately a failure, but it led him into the, the search for a typesetting machine. The solution was the linotype machine. Now, this machine revolutionized typesetting, especially in this country. To the newspapers, it made it very cheap for them to set up type. They didn't have to buy new type every time their type wore out. They just, it was new every day, new every morning. They could just have a linotype operator uh, typing away at his keyboard and and there was their type. They didn't have to pay him time to distribute the type to the, back to the cases at the end of the day. It was a great saving to the newspapers. The cost of typesetting in newspapers was enormous. And many papers were weekly because they simply couldn't set type fast enough. For a variety of reasons, uh, hand setting was really limiting the growth of newspapers. The linotype ended all that. And suddenly, with a linotype machine, even a small newspaper, even if it stayed a weekly, could become much larger. Where papers were formerly only about four pages in the average small town newspaper, they could be much larger. And in big newspapers, in big city newspapers, not only were there uh, bigger newspapers as a result of the linotype, they also could produce more editions. They could be more up to date. Toward the end of the 19th century, Linotype and high-speed presses helped create two newspaper giants, Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst, each fiercely competing for readership and the American dollar. One of the weapons of these newspaper wars was yellow journalism, played out in sensational headlines, an emphasis on personalities, and little regard for the truth. There grew up a kind of journalism in which sensational stories were, were popular and people, people have always wanted to look for juicy news, even if it wasn't true. The popular press in the 19th century uh, was a pretty wild and woolly uh, enterprise. You've seen, I'm sure, in old films, old movies, the pictures of the rotary press and the um, news, uh, newspaper being turned, uh, and this has become a kind of metaphor for print journalism in the 19th century, and often you will see the rotary press, the headlines coming out, and then the newsboy out on the street screaming, extra, extra. Uh, all of that is um, geared to 19th century methods. By the time yellow journalism faded at the turn of the 20th century, almost every affluent household in America received a newspaper subscribed to at least one magazine and had at least a small library of books. The 20th century also brought success to other print media. National magazines became a phenomenon, attracting mass audiences. Uh, mass circulation magazines began in this country around the turn of the century. And interestingly enough, it was the Ladies Home Journal that was probably the first major mass circulation magazine in the country. It had a circulation of around a million at the turn of the century, which was far more than anyone else had. And it sort of set uh, a pattern for other people. Two of those people were Yale graduates, Henry Luce and Britton Hayden. They assessed newspapers in the 1920s and decided time was ripe for a weekly news magazine. Uh, Lewis and Britton Hayden had the idea, what if somebody once a week just stepped back and kind of reviewed everything for you, you know, a neat package, and then the first prospectus it said that could be read on the way from Darien, Connecticut to Grand Central Station. Well, of course, the image was of a, of a middle-class businessman who commutes to New York uh, on a commuter train, and they persuaded some people to give them money, and Time Magazine was born. 20th century transportation and inexpensive postage pushed the circulation of major magazines into the tens of millions and continued to strengthen the importance of newspapers in American daily life. Print media had established itself as the first form of mass communication. However, the 20th century was to bring competition from other media that would force print to adjust and refocus in order to stay alive. Washington, 
The United States Supreme Court today handed down its long-awaited decision on the constitutionality London. of the national... The British Cabinet met in a special session today to determine the government's stand on the San Central Francisco. Europe. Despite all these technological changes, attitudes toward printing have not changed very much, which goes back to the 15th, 15th and 16th centuries. So uh, the problems posed by mass production of written material seem to lead to the same reactions. Whether we're dealing with the old hand press, the new steam press, or even later technologies. I read once that a, a single day's issue of the New York Times contains more information than a person in the 1400s learned in a lifetime. So we're just we have to sort out, we have to select what is available to us and decide what can we use. It's hard to tell what people are using that reflects their life in terms of the printed word. The mass-produced printed word was the first media wave to forever change society. The printed word is portable, yet fixed, disposable, yet permanent. Books, magazines, and newspapers inform and entertain, and they both reflect and reveal who we are to ourselves and future generations.